And we're live. Well, we're not live. We didn't do it live today. Uh, sorry, I was running a bunch of errands. Didn't have a chance to tweet it out and let people know we were going to be podcasting live. So he's Mike Nides, like I'm Zach Osterman. This is Mind Your Banners for October 29th, 2024. It is not live, but we have a lot of ground to cover. Mike, uh, have you have you fully uh, fully recharged from what was a, a rather busy week last week? No, because I had to do a lot of driving, and you sat home and did nothing. I, I like did. I, did. I didn't do nothing. I I chased my child around while my two year old around while he threatened to poop on various uh, neighbors. So, um, that, I mean, it's you know, we all have we all have to do something. We all have to contribute in some way. Um, it has been it has been as the title of the show would suggest a busy week. It's only going to get busier. So let's kind of dive in. We're going to start with basketball and then obviously talk quite a bit about football as well. But I wanted to clear the decks on basketball. Mike, you were there at Thompson Bowling Arena in Knoxville, Tennessee uh, on Rocky Top Sunday afternoon, Indiana 66, Tennessee 62. I thought this was a fascinating game, I'll be honest. Um, you know, it, 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 there's, there's still plenty for Indiana to improve on, obviously. Um, but I think if you are Indiana, you've got to be encouraged by a lot of what happened in this exhibition game. And we we will kind of acknowledge up front that it is an exhibition. Um, you know, I guess just first your your biggest takeaways from, you know, what you saw on Sunday. Yeah, and I'd caution, like you mentioned, it was an exhibition. And I don't know if you watched um, Rick Barnes' press conference afterwards. He said that they used a lineup – over the last nine minutes that they might not have otherwise used in a real game because um, he wanted to get some things on film and get them experience. Um, so I, I think, you know, um, they were sort of sacrificing maybe the sort of final score um, to, uh, you know, use the exhibition like you're trying to use the exhibition where you get experience in certain things. But um, overall for Indiana, like you said, um, some encouraging things, some maybe – and I think on the flip side, there were some some concerning things too. Like um, you know, Mackenzie Mbako still seems to me um, to be a player that um, you know not just a complete non-factor in the first half, and then couldn't miss in the second half. And you know, you want a guy that's a sophomore um, that you know seemed to take step step forward uh, at the end of last year to be you know more consistent. Um, um, you know, things like that. And, and Omar Bello, I was surprised uh, offensively. Um, I thought he might um, be a little more um, crisp and put together and just was very ineffective. But on the po positive side, I think it starts for me, you know, Malik Radu obviously took over in the second half, but Miles Rice is uh, a really impressive guard. Um, and I think he's got the chance to really um, – you know, I think the team might go as far as he takes them. Um, to be honest, I, I think he's he's a real dynamic talent. Um, and you know, I, I was texting you and asking you how you know when's the last time that Indiana had a guard like that? Um, and you and you said Yogi Ferrell. Um, and just you know, I was really impressed with him. And and you know, obviously, I think he's going to grow leaps and bounds from where he was last year. You know, coming off battling cancer um, and wasn't sort of in you know. Uh, physically in, you know, the, the best of places, but now, you know, is, is, you know, even further removed from that. And I think is going to be a really good player. I thought it was encouraging a, a couple of things. Um, number one, you know, just, I mean, it, it, it's never as simple as one versus one, but like Zakai Ziegler is, is, was SEC defensive player of the year. Um, last year, he is an incredibly experienced guard. He's been around forever. You know, the, the fact that, Rice could have the game that he had 20 points on seven to 14 shooting shot, eight free throws, four assists, no turnovers um, against a, a cover like that. I think it's really encouraging. I also thought it was really encouraging what Indiana was doing with him. Like, you know, it was, I mean, it was running ball screen offense that was built for him, not built to get somebody else a shot, but like it was setting screens for him, you know, three feet behind the three point line. When you do that, you are doing that because you want that point guard to get downhill. If you're if you're running ball screens, just kind of like side actions and things, that's usually more either for the screener or for somebody off the ball. When you are when you are putting when you're running that screen that far from the rim, what you're trying to do is get your your point guard moving downhill. And I think there were times, well, I know there were times because it, it, it 
quite literally happened, where Tennessee really just could not stay in front of him. And that's a Tennessee – I mean, Rick Barnes, we'll look this up like while we're talking. Obviously, again, talked about Zakai Ziegler and um, and what he has been for Tennessee the last several years. If you look at Tennessee's defensive metrics under Rick Barnes, they have been top five nationally in adjusted efficiency um, each of the last five seasons. Now, Indiana was not an efficient team overall offensively. Both teams got better in the second half. Indiana got better than Tennessee did, if that makes sense, and that's why they won the game. But my point is more within the structure of what is already a very good defensive program against a very, very good defensive player, I thought it was encouraging to see Miles Rice play the way that he did. You brought up Ballo, and, and I – listen, this is a one-game sample and, and all that stuff, but it did strike me – and obviously, I saw a decent amount of Umar Ballot at Arizona. I think we all did uh, because they played a lot of nationally televised games, a lot of big games. Um, it just struck me, though, that, like, I agree with you that I thought Ballo looked a little bit uncomfortable. Like, he, 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 you know, like he was, he kind of fumbled the ball a little bit. I didn't think, think his footwork was great. I was a little bit surprised at, you know, Felix Akpara, who obviously Indiana fans will remember from his time at Ohio State, where I, I didn't think he was that great of a player. There were moments, in isolation, anyway, when it felt like Akpara was winning that battle a little bit. Um, he had four blocks. Was, yeah, I mean, four four blocks. And, I mean, you don't want to go overboard with it because Ballo had 11 rebounds to Akpara's six. But still, you know, it, it did feel that way at times. But what I would say is what struck me with the complexion of the game and the way it played out was Indiana also kind of didn't need it, if that makes sense. And last year, I said this on – I did, like, the solo post game show uh, Sunday because you were traveling. Last year, Indiana's offense was so reliant on the two big lineups because it's bigs were its best offensive players. And like the ball had to go through at least one of them most of the time if Indiana was going to get a re you know a decent shot, if Indiana was going to get a, a reasonably sort of successful possession. This team, I think, has still got a ways to go offensively. You talk about how McKenzie and Baco still kind of burns hot and cold. I think you're, you know, you are encouraged by that second half, but you do, as you said, sort of want to look at McKenzie and Baco and say, okay, now, but you need to do it for all 30 minutes and not just 15 or whatever. Obviously, Kane and Carlisle had a pretty quiet day, missed some open threes. Indiana as a team did not shoot well from three. And yet you still have, you know, and Baco scores 12 points in all in the second half. I think Renew had 14 and was 21 in the second half. Two players with 20 plus. My point is, I think there are going to be nights like this one against good teams where Indiana can look at Omar Ballo and say, Don't worry about the offense. What we need from you is the rim protection and the rebounding. And if you are finishing possessions for us defensively, somebody else can handle the points. Somebody else can go score the points, make the shots, whatever. Like it's okay, I think. And this was why I was a, a little bit surprised when I saw some votes for Umar Ballo for Big Ten Player of the Year in our, our preseason media poll, and I kind of get it on reputation, you know, two-time first-team all-pack 12 player. But I just think on this team, there are going to be nights where Indiana can look at Ballo and say, you know, just be a game-changer for us on defense and then take whatever comes to you offensively because we've got other guys that can handle the offensive load. And I thought this game, well, I, I do think, I mean, I think he had three turnovers, I think, you know, Mike Woodson probably is going to ask more of him than what he played, you know, the way he played against Tennessee. I, I don't know that there aren't going to be some nights when we say, as a team, Indiana was successful and Umar Ballo has a game kind of like this. And we say, but that was fine because what, you know, he he solved a lot of the problems that needed solving at the defensive end. Tennessee only attempted 12 layups in this game. Indiana almost doubled them up and lay, uh, doubled them in layup attempts. And I think a lot of that is because of the presence Ballo has at the rim. You don't want to go there. And again, as long as you're getting offense from other areas, you know, from other positions at the other end of the floor, I think this kind of performance is okay for Ballard. Not great, but okay. Well, I think part of the, the not no layups, I mean, Tennessee was settling for three pointers very quickly. I mean, they shot 35 of them. So some of that was by um, design. I mean, they were very comfortable launching threes early and often uh, in that game. Um, and, and one thing I think we should point out. Um, is that this, you know, I'm not sure how much this will resemble what Indiana tries to do in terms of like lineups and minutes. All the starters played more than 30 minutes. They had three guys out, uh, Galloway, 
uh, Bryson Tucker and uh, Ja'Kai Newton. Um, I'd imagine the they'll do some, you know, spread that out a little more once, especially in the non-conference to sort of figure out um, some different units that work. I mean, I'd be surprised, I guess, if those five averaged more than 30 minutes a night during the, in, during the regular season. I think I, excuse me. Let's, I think that's fair. Sorry, I, did, I thought you had more to go. I was just filling yeah, in. I had a sneeze. I was, I was, I was, I was yeah. sneezed. Um, the the three point shooting is still a concern. I don't think you can get around that. And you know, again, Tennessee's a good defensive team. Um, it's also an arena that I don't think any of these players have ever played in. Certainly not in college. So um, unless you know, like unless maybe uh, you know, like Langdon Hatton or or somebody's been there and I didn't know about it. Um, you know, I saw a number of Indiana fans. I think understandably pleased at the volume that, that it just, I mean, Indiana missed all 11, but it, I think there were a lot of people that basically were just like, yeah, but we took 11 threes in one half. You know, I mean, there were, I mean, how many times last year was Indiana fighting to get to 13, 14 threes in a game? Um, and they shot 19th of the game. They shot 11 in the first half, missed all 11. They were four of eight in the second half. That is still something where you have, you had guys, Rice, certainly Carlisle and Baco hit a couple. But he also missed a couple open ones. Goody missed a couple open ones. There are some guys there that you probably say you expect to shoot better from three. And I think, once again, it's probably a game where Mike Woodson can point to some, some moments when the offense generated a good three-point shot that just didn't go down. But, like, Indiana fans justifiably are, are not going to have any grace with bad three-point shooting. Like, it, 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 until they see demonstrable improvement, I understand anybody who's concerned that you know, at the first time of asking this team shoot so poorly from behind the arc again. Yeah, and I mean, that was kind of what they did at uh, Hoosier Hysteria, too. I mean, there were no stats, but I mean, they did not shoot well. I think they went, they shot one early and then they didn't shoot again, one, uh, make make one again until like the final two minutes of the game. So the two opportunities uh, fans have, have been able to see this team, um, they have not, uh, I mean, it resembled last year, essentially. Yeah, I mean, and again, the offense, Particularly like like Ken and Carlisle missed a couple open ones. I'm interested in in Miles Rice. Like there's, you know, I mean, one of the things that made Yogi Ferrell and actually Jordan Holes before him as well really really good at that point guard spot was how good they were shooting uh, threes off the pull up. So like a lot of time, people tend to think of three pointers as something that are you know like a, a function of offensive creation. Um, Yogi Ferrell was an outstanding pull-up three-point shooter, which meant that if you didn't pick him up inside 25 feet, he could just pull up and make one, um, and that was the whole possession. And so, like, Miles Rice, I kind of set to one side, and obviously he's got to improve. Last year, um, I think he was 28, 20, 27, 28% at, at uh, Washington State. He's got to improve there. I think you can feel encouraged by some of the looks that you got for Kane and Carlisle, for McKenzie and Baco, for Luke Goody. But, you know, those those three players shoot a combined three of 19 or three of, excuse me, three of 15. Um, you know, that that I mean, that's got to be six or seven of 15, at least most nights. And listen, you can play this game. You can play this game with so many different statistics in terms of the well, what if this happened or what if that happened? But like if, you know, if Indiana does shoot. If those if those three players do shoot, let's say six of, of fifteen, which is what I think that's like forty percent. That's that's good, um, but it's not you know it's not unreasonable for those three players. That's three more threes in Indiana. Like the, the complexion of this game feels different. It, you you aren't just saying Indiana went on the road and won a, an exhibition game and um, you know against a decent team or a good maybe a good team. You, you're saying wow, they you know, Indiana kind of put it on and like. So many times last year, it felt like we were talking about Indiana from a position of failure or a position of weakness. I think if you're Mike Woodson, one of the advantages of winning this game is you can talk from a position of strength of saying, look at what you're capable of. Now imagine how much better it can be if we're all just 5% better than we were. Um, and you kind of need that because, and we've talked about this, you're really not challenging yourself a ton in the non-conference. So I think you also kind of needed this game, even though it doesn't do anything for like your NCAA tournament resume or anything like that. I think from a a confidence and a learning standpoint, I think Indiana needs this game 
and probably to some extent this result to really kind of get a, a, a good hard look at itself before, you know, long before conference play. Well, I think Woodson even talked about that. He doesn't want to see, you know, they had a ton of close games last year early in the schedule. And like, this isn't a team that should have that should struggle against lesser opponents. And he wants to see that. Um, he mentioned coming, you know, a very different sort of tone that he had last year about coming out of the gate and being a team that um, shouldn't be in those situations, um, you know, outside of the battle for Atlantis when you're, you're playing a little harder competition. Um, but there's, you know, probably about five or six games right off the bat where they should be winning by double digits and not have to sort of scrape and um, claw for to, to, to escape at home with the win. And so, you know, you don't hear any talk of even though this team does have as many new faces as last year or, you know, scholarship faces, he's not sort of hedging his bets. He wants to see a better team coming out of the, out of the gate. The last thing I, I wanted to ask you, because you were there, my impression was, number one, that the arena was pretty full. Number two, that it was fairly lively. Um, obviously, that is not going to be a full-on home court advantage for Tennessee. The game was chippy and not dirty, I don't think, by any means. In person, did it feel like, in, you know, Indiana at least got something approaching a, a genuine sort of road test as much as you can when the game doesn't mean anything? It just – I was surprised when they did a couple crowd shots at how many people were there and the, how engaged the crowd seemed to be with the game. Just because, like, it, I get it. It's Indiana, Tennessee, two top 20 teams. It sounded like there were a decent number of Indiana fans there, but, like, it's also just an exhibition game. I'm just curious, did, did you feel like Indiana got maybe a little bit of an environmental test, too? Um, I'd say probably the last five minutes. I, th I, I think the crowd was sort of just happy to be there, you know, for the first, you know, what, three quarters of the game. Um, the lower bowl is completely full almost. Um, there was a decent amount of Indiana fans that traveled, um, which isn't necessarily a surprise. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think they were as engaged sort of as the, you know, a typical crowd. Obviously it makes sense as an exhibition. But um, then when things tightened up and the game was, you know, I think uh, last four minutes – Indiana didn't lead by more than four. And so um, every possession was sort of, you know, the crowd was very into it. And I think that's where you probably got the sort of closest thing resembling to a road environment um, in, in that, that final stretch when Tennessee was trying to come back and, and cut the lead to one possession a couple of times. Um, any other business from IU Tennessee? No. So, any dining recommendations? Any, you know, any, any. I, you know, I did. I ate at uh, the Brass Pearl for lunch, and it was delightful. I wish I had more time in Knoxville. I'd never been in Knoxville. That was one of the SEC stadiums that I didn't get to travel when I was covering Auburn uh, to, to travel to one of the few. Um, uh, but it looked. It's like a, a fun. It's a fun it's town. A nice it's bigger than people think it is. I think it is. It is, and like, they have I mean, Market I mean, Square. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, I think people think of it as a college town, understandably. And it's not like a college town in the way like Columbus is a big city that's kind of defined by the university or Louisville's a big city. That's, it's not that big, but it's also not Athens. It's not Auburn. It's not Tuscaloosa. Like it's a it's a reasonable size city with a yeah. lot of fun stuff going on. Yeah, they had a, a market square that looked that looked pretty neat, and uh, obviously fans were walking around, and um, uh, it, it looked like a nice place. So um, nice little spot, but only got to spend what like four hours, and then <laughs> was, was back on the road. So it was a cameo appearance in Knoxville. You, I'm sure you still sang Rocky Top at the at the top of your lungs. Um, <laughs> let's shift gears, talking about Indiana Washington, then we'll do a little bit of uh, sort of forecasting or, or prep for Indiana Michigan State. You and I talked in, I think, one of the big themes of the post game, um, uh, the post game against uh, the post game podcast after Washington was the extent to which Indiana just kind of had to adjust on the fly. Washington threw some stuff at Indiana that it didn't expect. Um, it's been interesting to me to sort of process some of the national reaction to this game um, because I think there's like for the fact that Indiana once again never trailed. It, it feels like there's a bit more of a perception that Indiana got pushed in this game and that actually Indiana kind of came out with more credit in the eyes of, of some national sort of pundits and, and 
opinion makers, I guess, for lack of a better term, um, because there was sort of a sense that, you know, back quarterback, uh, you know, offense is suddenly isn't free flowing. Some things are, are just kind of, um, you know, some things are just kind of coming a little bit harder for Indiana and that they adjust and they win the game with a certain measure of physicality. Um, you know, I think there's something to be said for teams that learn how to win games multiple ways. And obviously this won't work against everyone, but I think there is value in a team that has, has been winning with a, a real level of style to maybe have to scrap a little more, to have to grind a game out just a little bit more. Um, I was puzzled rewatching um, some of it by some of Jet Fish's coaching decisions, but Indiana can't control that. It just has to worry about what's in front of it. And I think it, you know, it, it this felt like kind of the classic, a good team. Well, were you, well, I mean, what were you puzzled about with Jed Fish's coaching decisions? Well, we talked about on the post game podcast, we talked about like how the snap counts were so imbalanced early on because Indiana had those quick drives. But then once Indiana kind of gears up its run game, suddenly it's like 19 play drive. I think like, like what I, I'll just I'll look at the drive chart. I've got it up here. Indiana had a 19 play drive, a 14 play drive, and a 12 play drive. You know, it, there was the it was 24 14 when Washington punted the ball away. And that was, I think we talked about it in the post game podcast too. Like there were still more than 11 minutes left. It wasn't a natural time to go for it on fourth down. But the flip side is then when Washington gets down, you know, deep into Indiana territory and kicks a field goal late, and it's just sort of like, how many possessions do you think you've got left? Like, with the way that with the way this game is going, it, it felt like if if somebody had sat down and just kind of charted out the rest of the game a little bit better, they might have looked at Jed Fish on that fourth down and said, hey, we, we might kind of need to go for this. And obviously it's easy to say with the benefit of hindsight when Indiana actually got better field position off the punt than it would have gotten off a turnover on downs. I just thought, you know, I thought Indiana adjusted to what Washington was doing. And Kurt Signetti said this post game and, and it, it I don't know how much people picked up on it. Basically, he said Washington had been a man-to-man coverage team, and they came in off their bye week and played a ton of zone coverage that Indiana wasn't expecting and didn't prepare for. I'm presuming that was probably to be better against the run um, because if you're playing zone coverage, you don't have to follow players across the field. You can – you can load the box as much as you want as long as you're comfortable with, with – I thought it was to throw – I thought – see, I thought – I, I thought it would be to throw off Taven to give him different looks than they planned for. That that could be. I just I thought it was because I mean they had well, really they also struggled to run horribly in the second half. So they, they did, did, but I think that but like the, if you look at what Washington had failed at at the previous three weeks, it was yeah, no, yeah, yeah. And if you're playing the if you're playing zone, then you get to decide where your players are pre snap, not you know um, shifts trades motions, as our old friend Walt Bell uh, likes to say. Um, point is Indiana adjusted to that. And I just didn't think Washington then processed well, basically how that changed the terms of the game. And, and if anything, like they were kind of given a gift on that interception that turns very quickly into a Washington touchdown. You can make an argument. It was defensive pass interference one way or the other. You can't, you can't plan for getting a pick on the first play of the second half and turning that into two into seven points, two plays later. And still, it did not feel like Washington adjusted to the, the the way the game was played from that point forward. And and I think it's a credit to Indiana, its staff, its players, et cetera, that, that Indiana did. Well, I think we've talked all season about that, um, you know, one of the biggest advantages Indiana's had is their coaching. They've just been a well-coached team. Uh, they've made adjustments really well. Um, they've coached up players they've got you know they've coached up their depth which we thought was a weakness and they've sort of anytime they've had to go to the bench I mean like you know Taven didn't play great but they got enough out of them um you know every spot that they've sort of had to um get an advantage they've gotten one and, and from their coaching and I think it's part of the reason I mean you know big reason why these games have been you know kind of unfolded as they have that um, in, you know, Kurt Zignetti's staff and, um, you know, offensive staff in particular that's been together for so long um, has made just a really big difference with this with this program. 
has there been and it's funny because I asked you for the PFF grade numbers and you said the offensive line actually didn't grade up that well from the Washington game according to Pro Football Focus. I, I would still make this argument nonetheless. We've talked so much about you know the transfers Indiana brought in, the the, the staffing hires that Kurt Signetti either made or brought with him from um, from James Madison. Like, has there been a more important retention? than Bob Bostad because it felt like that. I mean, we talked about this a little bit last year that, that it felt like that offensive line actually got better in some ways in 2023. It just kind of didn't show up in the results because of failures else, breakdowns elsewhere in the offense. Um, That group has been on balance, I think really underrated to what Indiana has been able to do this season. And that's with, you know, probably to this point, assuming Curtis Rourke's thumb injury is not that long-term, that is with probably the most impactful long-term injury Indiana suffered, right? Like Nick Kidwell was supposed to be the starting right guard, knee injury in the preseason, out for the year. And we said, boy, they really can't afford to lose much more. And obviously, if you're Indiana, you're knocking on all the wood, you can find that they don't. But, um, you know, I mean – Indiana's pretty much played that starting five offensive line like every meaningful snap all season, and they have delivered pretty well. And it just, you know, it it again, there's there's so much understandable desire, even from like, you know, again, like national media, Big Ten media, whatever, to talk about all the new faces in Indiana. I actually think like Bob getting Bob Bostead back and probably getting Mike Kadick and, and Carter Smith back as well might be two of these sort of unsung. Uh, sort of wins of, of Kurt Signetti's, you know, first few weeks on the job. If you fast forward to where Indiana is right now, well, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, Kurt Signetti was maybe I don't know frustrated is the right right word, but disappointed that Taven kind of struggled as much as he did because I mean, dropped back nineteen times. He's only pressured twice. Um, they gave him all sorts of time to throw. Um, you know, the, the the PFF grade for their passing grade was high. It was eighty five, but the rest of it was 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 lower. Um, that was after the last two weeks of having a over ninety passing block uh, pass block grade uh, as a group. Um, and you know, as a man, I mean, I, I think Carter Smith still hasn't given up a sack, and I think there's there's two others on the offensive line that haven't given up a sack according to PFF. Um, they've just been, you know, uh, Chris and I talked about their chemistry. They've really grown together, um, and you know, two. You know, they got two guys on there that hadn't started a game or played any sort of meaningful snaps uh, in, in um, you know, Drew Evans and Bray Lynch. And the group sort of came together really fast. Um, and I don't think you can kind of understate sort of their importance. I mean, they've been trending in that direction from last year. But, I mean, they, they still had to kind of regroup because they lost most of the, the line. So, um, yeah, and I still think they're better than last year, too. I, I'm, I'm just saying, like, we – we talked about some of the progress last year under Bostad in his first year. But I'm just and saying he laid a foundation with his coaching and the group was improved. Yeah. And so um, – but they took another step and even had to add a bunch of new faces. So, um, you know, it's a credit to to them. I mean, it, 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 in, in Bostad in particular, um, obviously, you know, the system probably makes a difference. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you can understate the, the importance that offensive lines had to this offensive success, um, like you said. I think we have to talk about Taven Jackson and we'll talk about Curtis work a little bit um, later on when we get into kind of Michigan state prep, but you know, it's, I thought he had a funny day. Um, I don't think he necessarily played great. Um, It's funny because the intersection interception, actually, I'm not sure is even one of the two or three sort of like worst. It wasn't a great decision, but I don't think it was, I don't think it was like the worst decision he made all day. Um, you know, you, you walk up the field and, you, and, yeah, you feel like Indiana's not necessarily in, like, a, a great place offensively. It's the first time all year I think they haven't broken 400 yards. It's the first time all year they're outgained by their opponent. And yet the quarterback does account for two of the three offensive touchdowns. Um, you know, I, I, again, we mentioned a little bit Washington kind of changing some things up, whether that was to confuse Taven Jackson or it was to – you know, to, to try and shore up some of Washington's own recent struggles or both. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily think, I mean, that's certainly not his best game in an Indiana uniform. I think that's probably still the Louisville game. I think that's 
I think we can probably agree on that, but that the game he played against Louisville last year at Lucas Oil was probably his best single game performance at IU. Um, but it's still like more than enough. And he still presides over again, a game where Indiana never trails, wins by multiple scores. Um, the game's never even tied in the second half. Covers the spread if that's big, you know, if, it, if that's something you care about. Like, I don't know. I mean, some of this is coaching, some of this is is performance. I think if he has to play at Michigan State, I suspect, you know, this week will have done him some good. Um, but I think if you're Taven Jackson, if nothing else, you are allowed to feel now like you contributed something meaningful to this season. You had to start a game, you had to step in in the middle of the Big Ten season. You stepped in, you started, you won. And uh, I think there's something to be said for that for a young quarterback, too. Yeah, and, and you know, look, he didn't play the, terrible, but I don't think he played very good. And I think that, you know, the the, the uh, D'Angelo Pons has probably more to do with the victory than than Taven does. Even I mean, you know, Taven did throw a touchdown and, and run for one, but uh, without sort of those interceptions and how that set up the rest of the game, you know, this this was close. Uh, in, in Washington, obviously, oh, what was it? Uh, 17 what was, it was the 17 14 after the pick and then the quick touchdown yeah so um you know I, I think that the, the defense and obviously get a big punt return sort of um I think helped IU overcome sort of Taven's struggles and I think you know just the lack the, the, there was a lot of you know some of the throws he had were really off target um and I just think Signetti sounded a little disappointed with just how rough around the edges the performance was. I just couldn't tell like how much of that was Taven and how much of that was Indiana getting caught. Cause I, I, I suspect he's also the kind of coach that like, like I, I remember there was a, um, <laughs> I remember that there was a clip of Nick Saban after the kick six in what was that? 2013, 2014, somewhere in there. I think it was 2013. And Everybody points out afterward the whole reason the kick six happens is because Alabama puts a bunch of big guys on the field for field goal protection. And then when the ball's out in the open field, none of them are natural tacklers and none of them are very fast. And so, like, they all take a bunch of bad angles at, at, the, at Chris Davis and he runs past all of them for a touchdown. And somebody catches Nick Saban on the sideline and you can read his, you can read his lips saying, I told you that would happen. <laughs> and, like, I think there are – I think there are coaches that that just also get like inordinately mad when they know that they didn't just like absolutely ace the coaching matchup. And like, I think like part of me wondered how much Signetti was frustrated with individual players performances and how much of him was frustrated that Washington did something like, you know, a Indiana didn't anticipate B Indiana by Signetti's own admission couldn't really adjust to on the fly couldn't couldn't fix you know quickly and that C sort of basically got to a place where it just required Indiana to scrap everything and and roll you know roll forward I don't know I I um well I think Signetti said something like you know Jackson had some good plays he had some plays that when he watches it I mean he he basically made it sound like mixed bag from Taven Jackson I just wondered if some of Signetti's frustration wasn't at the the wider performance and maybe even to some extent without wanting to put words in anybody's mouth, the coaching performance. And again, we're saying this about a game where Indiana still scores 31 in a conference game. Indiana still covers the spread. Indiana still wins by two touchdowns. Indiana still is not allowed a point in the first quarter. Indiana in this game did only allowed a field goal in the fourth quarter. Indiana has still not trailed for a single snap all season. At this point, like if, if you look at the, uh, the football ESPN's football power index and the, the projections that ESPN has there, they've got Indiana 68.4% likelihood of making the playoff. That's higher than Texas A&M. That's higher than Ole Miss. That's higher than Tennessee. That's higher than Notre Dame. That's higher than Alabama. Like, I mean, it. it <laughs> we're talking about this, and this is, you know, maybe the nerviest game Indiana's played this season, and they still win by 14 points. I, you know, it. it I guess maybe to some extent it also speaks to just the standard that Kurt Signetti holds, whether it's of himself, his staff, whoever his starting quarterback is, whoever, whoever is starting anything is that it seems like Indiana comes out of this game, you know, still sort of feeling like, 
this wasn't good enough, even though, <laughs> you know, by by the most basic and standard measures, it very clearly was. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, that's you get that from every time he speaks, he holds to those standards. I mean, that's all standards is basically 75 percent of what he talks about. Um, I don't know, turning our attention to, to Michigan State, uh, you know, Curtis Rourke, uh, what Signe said was optimistic and that his work, you know, he's already thrown or started throwing and his workload is going to increase throughout the week. Um, you know, I don't think he'd say that they were optimistic without sort of a good feeling that he probably will get the starting nod, you know, that they wouldn't set those expectations. You know, he's been fairly straightforward when it comes to whatever he does share about injuries, not like with Tom Allen where he's like, well, I'm not optimistic about him being alive this weekend, not to play It's funny weekend. because, like, he doesn't share stuff. And I was thinking about this, like, even thinking back to, like, the, the quarterback race where he's like, we're not going to name a starting quarterback. But I'm going to say a lot of stuff over the next six months that tells you who our starting quarterback is. Like, he's like, we're not yeah. naming a starter, but Curtis Rourke separated himself even more. Like, it, you know, it's – it, it, there's it's Curtis like Rourke, political... there's the rest of the room over here, and they don't, then neither they should. Yeah, it, it's like a political poll where it's like, we're not going to tell you what the actual results were, but it was it was only good for one candidate. And like, I don't know, it, it, like he's done that with the injuries, like, this is all I'm going to say about it, but what I'm going to say makes it very clear that things are going well. Like, and that's what he said the last two weeks. He said, like, the only thing I'm going to say about Curtis Rourke is basically everything you want to know, other than like putting the x-ray up on the screen and being like, well, the injury was here and we fixed it this way. Like the way he termed it Monday, it sounded like Rourke had already been throwing last week and Indiana was going to be ramping up his activity this week. And that there was basically, it sounded like even more optimism than there was last week that it wasn't a long-term injury. I mean, like if you, if you made me, if you, if you put me, you know, you just said like, will he or won't he? I think Curtis Rourke plays Saturday. Like that was very much and stuff can go wrong. Obviously there can be setbacks. I don't know with, obviously we don't know the exact nature of the injury. I don't know how many setbacks there can be when ultimately it seems like basically the question is, can he grip the football or not? It's not like he's trying to play through broken ribs or like a strained hamstring where it's like, it's going to, he's going to have to warm up and see how he feels and take some contact and see what that feels like. Like either he can grip the football or he can't. Um, I mean, my, my sense is he's going to play this week. Yeah, and so, I mean, that sets up a game against a Michigan State team that um, you've talked up throughout the season. I don't know why. Um, I, I, think they, <laughs> I think they kind of stink. Um, uh, you know, lost to a Michigan team that um, has changed quarterbacks, I think, four or five times, four times at least, I believe, obviously, because they cycled through all three and now have gone back to the start. Um, but, you know, rotated in games and are playing, I think, rotating two guys, you know, all giving the, the dual threat, Alex Orgy, some snaps. But regardless of Michigan, we'll get there in two weeks. Uh, Michigan State loses that game and, what, gave up only like 200 yards of offense losing that game? Does that sound right? Something like that. So, I mean, th there's just no way, I, even if Taven Jackson were to get a start, that I think Michigan State can keep pace uh, with this IU team. Um, yeah, you said I've, I've talked it up and you don't know why. Um, I'll be honest. I, I did think Aiden Childs would be better. Like that, that's, that's a big part of why I believed in, in Michigan state, because I, I think a lot of Jonathan Smith is a coach and Childs came with him from Oregon state. And I thought there'd be, I know he's young, but I thought there'd be a little bit more of kind of a, you know, like a, a level of a measure of continuity. Um, he was, Pretty good against uh, Maryland, three touchdowns, two interceptions. He had a pretty good game against Iowa, which I think is worth something. Like that, you know, that's that's the last home game um, Michigan State played. They put up 32 points on a good Iowa defense. Childs threw for 256 and a touchdown, completed 73.3 percent of his passes. Um, but ultimately, like Michigan State just has not. I mean, they are average at best rushing the passer they are well below average uh, protecting the passer you know if you look at like their none of their sort of statistical averages game by game are particularly impressive offensively and i think that's the that's the biggest thing that this comes down to is if if jackson plays if jackson starts i, I do suspect he will be better than he was last week just because he'll have 
the whole process of, of go through a game week, prep, start, learn from your mistakes, whatever. If I, I still think, you know, then I, I, I still think it's a nervy thing for Indiana because it is one of the tougher places for this program to play. It is a rivalry game. Um, you know, it's, it's almost certainly the, the first, I mean, like, I don't know that UCLA game, there were more UCLA fans in the Rose Bowl than I expected there to be, but, I think this is probably the toughest road environment Indiana's faced of the three, probably comfortably um, to this point in the year. But I still think that Michigan State's sledding uphill if Jackson starts. If Rourke starts and performs anywhere near what he's done so far this season and the offense goes with him, um, like you're in a position, if you're Michigan State, where you have to pretty dramatically outperform like a lot of your statistical averages and, and performances to this point in the season um, to, to even be able to keep pace. I mean, cause like this is an Indiana team that's been on the road twice this season. They've broken 500 yards. I think in both of those games, they scored 42 at the Rose bowl. They scored 41 at Northwestern. I mean, you know, if you're Michigan state, like you've got to be at least two touchdowns better off statistically speaking than you are right now as a team to even keep pace if Indiana is anywhere near full strength offensively. And that's, I think that's a big ask. Well, to show, highlight the disparity, Michigan State has scored 17 touchdowns in eight games. Do you know the number for Indiana? Is it 50? 51? 51. 51. 51. Because they got, because the interception counts. Yeah, that was, because I think that was their, what, their second defensive touchdown. They scored 49 off. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. So I mean, I like, mean, it, yeah, they got a, Michigan State's got a nice freshman receiver. Nick Marsh is pretty good, but I mean, they can't struggle getting the ball. And so I mean, that, yeah, like you said, that quarterback situation for a guy that uh, you know, Jonathan Jonathan Smith rotated in the lineup throughout last season to sort of get him, um, you know, some run. And uh, I think he would started the oh, no, he didn't play the whole game, but um, you know, got a, a decent amount of snaps last year. Um, just has not um, you know talked about. I think going into the opener that they were gonna you know be a great offense, and I, wasn't he the guy that said bet the over uh, quarterback? Uh, Aiden who did um, have not, have uh, have not not been sharp, and so I mean, you just Indiana, you know, there's there's just no way. And Unless they just play an egg. Unless they just play an There's no way. It is a rivalry game. Again, this is – I mean, seriously, this is the – this is the toughest road environment this team has faced together at Indiana, probably by some distance. The flip side is Michigan State is coming off a, a pretty punishing stretch. You know, they had they, – Ohio State, Oregon, they, they beat Iowa, but then Michigan – you know, this is like the the lesser rivalry game, basically, of the two they're going to play this season. It is for Indiana. So you're still you're still convinced there's a day you, you're you're giving them you're sticking you're holding to. I'm them. giving them a chance, but I like I said, I I expected Michigan State to be better offensively than it's been, and you know, at a certain point, you know, I know teams can change over the course of the season, but like at a certain point. You just kind of are what you are. And eight games into a season, I don't think you're just going to flip a switch. Now, you know, I, I I do suspect that that Iowa game is is probably, you know, going to be appointment viewing for Indiana. I think I think Indiana is going to want to know what it was about that game that um, that really kind of, you know, turned up. But like even in that game, Michigan State, you know, kicked six field goals like that. I mean, the, even that game felt as much about Iowa and Iowa's own problems offensively as it did Michigan state. I don't think there's a world where, especially if Curtis work starts, Michigan state can afford to, you know, can get, can get away with like playing the, the field goal game when it's got a team in Indiana that can probably score a touchdown in just about any possession. Um, Indiana hasn't given up six field goals all season, which is, <laughs> well, I, mean, like, I just, it's, it, I just think there'd have to be so many failures across the the roster, you know, like the like it's just something we have we haven't seen, and you know, you know, maybe the quarterback situation if Rourke takes a hit on the thumb or something and that throws a wrench in it. I just think something would have to go wrong 
for them to lose to a team that's been playing. I mean, look, Michigan State's defense had a, as good of a game as you can have against Michigan, and they still – Law. I mean, it wasn't like it's just they just don't they can't score. They just can't score. There's, and there's not something that like you you hang your hat on. I mean, I guess they're they're okay. They're they're top three in the conference in opponent red zone conversions. I, I mean, I guess that works. I guess that's okay. Um, <laughs> that works. Uh, but like it's just you know like there's not there's not something. It's not like they're amazing against the run or they've got a really dynamic pass rusher or, you know, I mean, even Childs, like the other thing I thought about Childs was that, you know, he'd, he'd kind of make them a little bit more dynamic offensively. And again, I know he's a young guy, like he is what he's, I think he's a true sophomore, or maybe a redshirt sophomore, but like it, it just, especially if, like if, if Taven Jackson plays, it's on the road, he's young. Obviously, we saw him struggle at times last week. You know, that throws kind of a, a, a just kind of a gremlin into the system that you're not sure about. And you just kind of need to see Indiana work through it. But I'm not, first of all, I'm I'm not at all convinced Indiana can't work through it. Second of all, um, if Rourke starts, I just, you know, I don't know where you go if you're Michigan State for, you know, I, I don't know where you go for your, um, or the number of points you're going to need to keep up with, you know, <laughs> maybe the best offense in the Big Ten. They've only scored more than 27 points against a uh, against a, a an FBS opponent. They, they they beat Prairie View A and M 40 to nothing. They've only scored more than 27 points against an FBS opponent once. That was Iowa two weeks ago. Um, Indiana, by comparison, has never scored less than 31, like not one time. And that's, you know, that like – and the two times they did that are probably the two games that we would look back on and say where they were like the most sort of like wonky offensively, first game mistakes, last game, you know, backup quarterback had to kind of scrap some of the game plan. I just – you never know. Um and you don't know, like, is there going to come a point when all this becomes too real for Indiana? I don't – I mean, I don't think it, there will be, but, like, you, you're never sure, right? Like, you never – like, to, I mean, tomorrow's a concept. You never was, know. Was, I, you know, I did not I did not take that into account. I did not take that like, into tomorrow account. Tomorrow is a concept, and you – we, should, we should change the name of the podcast to Tomorrow is a Concept. Um, you know, oh. the only thing that – you mentioned, uh, you know, a mobile quarterback. Indiana really hasn't – had to deal with that. Like if they had changed their gun, but I mean, they haven't done that all season, Michigan state. I think the most yards Charles has is like 50 yards, 11 carry for 50 yards. But if they did something like unique like that and like try to throw them off and just, uh, but I just, it, it just, it's hard to imagine, um, you know, to, to go to a whole new, you know, different game plan, to take advantage of, of that uh, when they really haven't done that all season. Um, looking it up. Yeah. The most he's only had double digit carries twice. Um, he was good in the run. BC game. He can do it, but like when they played a good defense, he's not been able to. So Michigan eight carries for six yards. Oregon twelve for twenty nine. Ohio State six for minus nine, which obviously is going to be affected by sacks. But the point is, like when they played teams that play good sound defense, Michigan State has not been able to take advantage of that. Well, my point is that it, 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 Indiana hasn't faced that, so maybe that it takes them a half to get sort of a, you know like it's something different. But like like you said, they just haven't executed that very well. So it's not like I don't think you have to be like on the lookout for it necessarily. I mean, you're conscious of his athleticism, but it's not something where you feel like even if they th you know threw a new game plan out, you know, and try to trick Indiana. Like you said, their coaching's been so good. They'll just make the adjustments and, and get through it. I I just don't see it. I mean, maybe you know, I I guess what you give them a chance. I don't know. We'll see. I mean. I I you just, sound you know, daunted. This is against their 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 motto. I, I just that they're never daunted. The, well, I, I, it's not my job to be daunted or not daunted. Um, it does seem like good seats are still available for this game. Um, I'm looking at I'm looking on uh, vivid seats right now, and like I mean, you know, you can most of the stadium is is relatively open, so I don't know what kind of road environment you're going to get. But listen, it, I mean, it is toughest road game Indiana's played to this point. Um, it's a fascinating warm-up for the final three games because I, what I would say is 
and obviously not, you know, not um, Chris Ignetti won't do this, but, but you and I can do this because tomorrow doesn't have to just be a concept to us. Um, but I have kind of told people like this game is the inflection point where I think you should start talking about the playoff. If you're Indiana, like if Indiana gets through this game undefeated, then that's when I think the playoff becomes a real thing because it, you know, when you're six and oh, seven and oh, yeah, if you keep winning, sure, you'll get to the playoff, but like it becomes much more of a here is the path and you start being able to narrow down some Big Ten tiebreakers. And obviously, Ohio State plays Penn State this weekend, so that's going to have an effect on the Big Ten race. Um, in fact, I think if I'm not mistaken, that's the last time any of these four teams that are kind of at the top of the Big Ten will play each other all season. So, like, it's it's kind of the last big, you know, wrench in the system, so to speak. Um, but I just think, like, it, it – it, Well, Ohio State plays Indiana. Well, okay, fair. But I'm talking about outside of Indiana's control or, or outside of, like, how it would oh, change. Got it. And I'm thinking, that's not right at all. But, okay, continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, but either way, it's – this has always felt like the one to me. And again, part of it is also it's a rivalry game. Like Indiana has not had a ton of success. I think they've only won once at Spartan Stadium in like the last 20 years. And these two teams did play each other every year in the old Big Ten East. And I think they were in the in the in the in the heady days, the legends and leaders. I think they were in the same division then as well. Um, I'd have to go back and double check. But the point is, like, this is it's the toughest road game Indiana's played yet. You do have some uncertainty at quarterback. It's not been a place that's been particularly kind it's to this twice at it's East always Lansing, felt like just... game where if Indiana's if Indiana's still undefeated through the end of this game, that's when I think you can start talking in a very in a non theoretical but like very real way about the playoff. Just to correct your stat, they've won twice in East Lansing since two thousand twenty. Okay, I'm so... not counting the COVID year. I'm sorry that like the COVID year is just its own thing. It's very different. Okay, but but this, I think the game two years ago was wild though. Indiana trailed by seventeen points like twice in the fourth quarter or something. Isn't that the Michigan Dexter Williams State. game? Yes, and Michigan State missed a field goal. It was a chip shot field goal, and and I was I, I stayed back because I think there was a home basketball game that night or something, and I was watching it on TV and like I've never seen a kicker that even just like staring at the back of his helmet on the TV broadcast, I could be like, this kid is there's no there's no chance they would have a better chance pulling someone out of the student section and asking them to attempt the kick. This is not, he's not going to make it. And But how isn't. far things have changed, right? You stayed home to not cover football. I mean, it, well, it wasn't also, a, what you're saying, it. a lot of what you're saying is percept. Like, I mean, it's not this Indiana team, right? Like rivalry game past, like, what does it matter? Like Kurt Signetti is not going to give, you know, uh, you know what? I get like, that, but to, to quote our our good mutual friend Mike Glasscott, they're Indiana football until they're not. I mean, have they not? They've not been that this season. I, you know, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what the I don't know what yeah, the fighting is. Kurt Signetti's. That you know, I don't know what you, what the else they need to do to prove to you that they're not. You know, it's like I, I to me, it's that all that stuff goes out the window when with the staff and what they've done, and I think they've earned the right. I mean, they've won on the road. They went to the Rose Bowl. They, you know, one of the rare teams to have win, you know, two time zones away. Uh, you know, they won at that little, uh, 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 you know, uh, pop up stadium, pop up rink uh, on the on the river. Um, on the you know, river, whatever on the lake, Michigan River, <laughs> on the lake. A wide um, river. I, I think they've earned the benefit of the doubt in terms of like this isn't, you know, whatever the history of the rivalry is. I, I just don't think that mattered. Maybe. You, I mean, you might be right. Um, we'll finish with this just, just to keep it simple. Like, do you think Curtis Work plays Saturday? Yes. I do too. All right. We'll leave it there. Um, we will be, we will both be in East Lansing. We will do our post game podcast, et cetera. Um, uh, we'll do it live as planned, provided we can find a place to support the stadium press box, do it, which I'm sure we can. Uh, but until then, for the Indianapolis Star, for the Bloomington Herald Times, he's Mike Nislick. I'm Zach Ostman. This has been Mind Your Banners. Thank you so much for listening. We look forward to talking to all y'all soon.